I'm going to go ahead and get started today. You are here for the Special Needs Advisory Coalition of Palm Beach County's respite webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about what respite is and how can respite services and support provide you and your family with different help during these challenging times. Um, so what <clears throat> welcome today's free online recorded informational event offered by SNAC and the respite committee of Palm Beach County. My name is Susanna Launder. I'm a clinical support specialist with the FAU Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, member of the community and respite care companion trainer. Today you'll be provided with information on respite services, the benefit of respite services, agencies offering respite care services, and provisions made to ensure safety during the pandemic. As we start, we're going to very quickly review our agenda and who will be speaking. Um, I gave you guys your welcome. I'm Susanna Launder. We will be followed by the SNAP committee and the respite committee representation. And then the Florida Lifespan Alliance and Respite Association will be speaking. We will be talking about how respite services can help you and your family. And then we are going to spend some time learning about what respite services are available in Palm Beach County. We have a variety of just wonderful agencies that are here today to talk to you about their services and how they are implementing respite here in Palm Beach County. Um, and then finally, towards the end, uh, we will be discussing some training that is available for individuals that may be interested in becoming a respite companion. Um, and then we are gonna have some time for question and answer and then some closing remarks at the end. So without further ado, I am going to pass the mic to Sharon Alexander from the Unicorn Children's Foundation. Thank you, Suzanne. It's, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, I am Sharon Alexander, CEO of the Unicorn Children's Foundation. I've been with the organization going on 15 years now. Um, our mission is really dedicated to creating cradle to career pathways for individuals with developmental and learning disabilities and helping their families navigate the very complex journey. Um, we really want to see a world where all of our children, regardless of their disabilities, have every opportunity to be fully engaged um, in their communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of some of our cradle to career programs. Um, everything from uh, community convening um, to create more collective impact through our special needs advisory coalition. Um, we've offered uh, different family navigation tools such as our parent coaching scholarships to give parents the tools and strategies that they need to help their children develop critical life skills throughout their everyday routine, all the way up through transition and adulthood with our vocational training and employment. Um, in fact, this week on Thursday, we have a Creative Workforce Solutions Conference or Solutions Summit that's coming up, talking about um, alternative means of employment. And the reason this is all really important is um, it's the whole self-care model, right? Um, if we can't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of other people. So. We really need the community to gather around together um, to provide the supports to our families to ensure that they are able to take those moments of self-care so that they can then in, um, in turn help their children. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we were doing, uh, we had great high hopes on in February 1st, we moved into a new facility, mm -hmm. a 4,200 square foot facility called the Unicorn Connection Center. Um, which was going to be a one-stop community hub where um, families could come, that there would be opportunities for social recreational opportunities, vocational training, um, and employment uh, programs for, uh, for young adults through our Special Perks Cafe and our Uniquely Gifted Boutique. Um, but obviously we were there for six weeks and now I pay rent, pay rent on a lovely building that's sitting in isolation. But the goal really here was to provide families with some type of venue where, you know, their young adults or their teens would have a place to go um, that would offer some inclusion opportunities, but also give the families a break, you, you know, needing that respite to get out to go shopping and knowing that 
their loved one was being taken care of at the same time as learning new skills or engaged in social recreational opportunities and creating friendships um, outside of the home setting. Um, we're still on strategically on path to open this. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, work behind the scenes to make sure that um, as soon as we are able to proceed to in-person um, programming, um, we are, are, you know, we will have a seamless transition, um, not away from the virtual. I think the virtual is here to stay. It has taken away geographic barriers um, and transportation barriers, um, but uh, I think we'll be looking at some te hybrid tech programs. Next slide. So uh, the Special Needs Advisory Coalition was formed in 2015. It started with about 60 members. Um, at that time, we were getting ready to do a countywide community needs assessment to understand the landscape of services and supports uh, for individuals with special needs or disabilities and their families. Um, this organization has grown, and again, this is a strictly a volunteer organization, has grown to over 500 members representing about 175 agencies across um, the county. One of the initiatives that we um, heard from families through interviews, focus groups, and surveys was that information and referral was difficult, difficult to find. So we have spent the last five years um, creating special needs pbc.info. It is currently active on the web, but it is still in soft launch mode. So we encourage any of your attendees um, to take a look, scroll through it. Um, it focuses on age-related uh, information, so you are not searching, you know, a hundred different sites trying to find the information that's relevant to your child. You simply click into uh, whatever age is um, related to your child, um, and we've partnered with 211, which is our county's first call for help with their special needs hotline, so we can connect you directly to resources, including respite, uh, respite care services. Next slide. So one of the seven um, findings that came out of our year long community needs assessment was the need for respite. And I think we probably each all in our own individual ways on this call realize that we don't take the time for self care. Um, I know that Mary Ellen and Pam Heyer who's now retired had been looking into rest the, the needs for respite but our community needs assessment just further reinforced that this is really a priority in our community, a priority need. Um, so we sort of merged our efforts because it didn't make sense for the Special Needs Advisory Coalition to go out and start addressing the respite um, issues when so much work had already been completed. So from that, we really formed a beautiful partnership with Children's Services Council, um, United Way, Unicorn Children's Foundation, and after um, Mary Ellen, I know we laughed at this um, many years ago, but after doing uh, months and months of work, probably at least over a year's time in, in developing a curriculum, uh, we had one new member attend our, our meeting and said, hey, look, there's this national evidence-based respite cu curriculum um, in a box. So we were able to bring down um, two master trainers who uh, we offered scholarships mm -hmm. to 16 individuals who had applied to become rest, uh, rest trainers. Um, those rest trainers were then to go out and train 20 companions each mm -hmm. per year. And because we wanted to make sure that this was a sustainable program going forward, um, we did fund uh, to have two master trainers in Palm Beach County who could then continue to expand the number of rest trainers thereby um, exponentially expanding the number of qualified respite companions in the community. Um, so we're really proud to have been part of that. Um, it's a great curriculum. Um, I, I just think our real challenge right now, and especially during COVID and especially during our spatial distancing um, is getting families to take that breath and reflect and realize that they really need to take some time for themselves too. Um, it's overwhelming um, for all of us in the current pandemic situation, but sp especially for families who have lost their educational supports and services, their therapeutic providers, and their you know, families who are trying <clears throat> to figure out 
how to do all of this on their own. I think it's important for us as a community and with FAU card, uh, getting the information out to these families that, you know, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to ask for a break. And we do in fact have services and supports um, within the community to help uh, make this transition a little easier. Uh, so I wanna thank all of the organizations who are out on the front lines and providing these respite services. I wanna thank FAU Card for um, having us involved um, and partnering with us for a number of years. And uh, let's all work together to get these families the help they need. Um, so thank you for having me. And at this point, I'm going to um, turn it over. Oh yes, here, sorry, here's my contact information. Uh, we're all online, but uh, working remotely, but I'm you know, free and available for you to contact. And now I will turn it over to Cheyenne Weatherspoon from United Way, who was one of our uh, key partners in the um, REST training program. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheyenne Weatherspoon. I'm the Director of Community Impact at United Way. And it is a pleasure to be here with everyone today. So thank you. Um, We'll just start by really quickly acknowledging that November was National Family Caregivers Month. And the theme this year was caregiving around the clock. The goal of proclaiming November as National Family Caregivers Month is to nationally honor, recognize, support, and really empower family caregivers who provide loving care for their relatives who may be ill or elderly or disabled. This is, as we know, an incredibly difficult and often thankless job. And it's been made even more difficult with the COVID-19 pandemic because many of our families are facing illnesses, are losing employment, or they may be unable to access their normal support networks due to travel bans and social distancing guidelines. So our theme for November, Caregiving Around the Clock, really kind of reminds our family caregivers who spend so much time caring for others that they really have to take the time to make, take care of themselves as well. So now more than ever, there is really a big push to help family caregivers identify supports and resources to remind them that they're not in this alone. Next slide, please. So we're here today to talk about respite, which is a service that can really be a great source of support for family caregivers. And we're going to start by watching a short video that's going to give us a nice overview of what respite is. Maybe. So I'm not sure if the sound is working, so I can narrate uh, to help out. So how does respite help? Respite care helps prevent burnout by offering the relief <laughs> and renewal caregivers need to maintain their own health and well-being. It allows caregivers to take time to recharge and focus on their personal needs. Who needs respite care and what types are available? Respite care can be provided for anyone with any type of special need or any age. Types of respite care include daily in-home care. <laughs> hmm. Okay, we'll just start here. It's fine, we can skip the video, it's okay. So let's just talk about what respite is. Um, as we would have seen in a video, respite is planned or emergency services that provide a caregiver of a child or an adult with a special need, some time away from their caregiving responsibilities. Respite can be provided in the comfort of your own home or it can be provided at a community-based facility. Respite services are available really anytime, before and after school, in the evenings, overnight, and on weekends. Respite gives family caregivers time to take care of personal needs, such as going to doctor's appointments, 
running errands, or really just taking some personal time to recharge. And taking time apart from daregiving, daily caregiving responsibilities is really important for family caregivers because long-term caregiving can have negative impacts on both our physical and our mental health. Uh, next slide, please. So according to the American Psychological Association Stress in America study, up to 50% of family caregivers meet the criteria for major depression, whereas less than 10% of the general adult population meets that same criteria. 55% of family caregivers report feeling overwhelmed by their daily caregiving responsibilities. And many say that positive activities in their daily lives are reduced by nearly 30% as a result of their caregiving responsibilities. So these statistics really highlight the importance of supporting our family caregivers by providing respite services. Respite services improve mental and physical health outcomes by helping family caregivers reduce stress and by helping them increase their opportunities for positive social interactions. And as our theme for National Family Caregivers Month reminds us, we have to take good care of ourselves in order to take care of others. So I will now turn it over to Mary Ellen, who's gonna to talk to us about how respite services can help you and your family. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Ellen Quinlani. I'm with FAU CARD. I'm the director of FAU CARD and have had the pleasure of serving with all of um, these wonderful agencies and people here that you will be acquainted with. Um, I think Sharon and both Shane and Sharon both mentioned um, about the importance of respite care. But um, one thing I think that we, we need to talk about is the fact that many parents don't avail themselves of respite care. They feel that um, it's a weakness or that they need to do it on their own. Um, so I think I just wanna stress the fact that uh, respite is something that we all need and can help us be better parents. I think this quote here um, from the New York Times, July of 2014, really sums it up well. All parents endure stress, but studies show that parents of children with developmental disabilities, particularly autism, experience depression, anxiety far more often. Struggling to obtain crucial support services, the financial strain of paying for various therapies, the relent relentless worry over everything from wandering to the future, all of it can be overwhelming. And so we just want the community to know and parents to know that we're there for them and that there are services and particularly during this time of COVID. Next slide, please. What, um, and I think Sharon, again, Sharon and um, Shane um, stressed this, but some of why is respite care important? Um, it's a requested and need, needed family support. Several years back, the respite committee did a survey to get um, to identify what the needs are. And it is a, a needed support that families um, really rely upon. It is also a preventative strategy that strengthens families and protects family health and well being. We know the impact of stress on, on individuals and on the family. It allows individuals to remain in their home. Um, this is raising a child with a disability is, you know, is a marathon and, and um, parents need to pace themselves and need to know that there are supports out there for them. It prevents and delays more costly out of home placements. It reduces the risk of abuse or neglect and it helps to keep all family members safe and stable. So we hope that this um, webinar will be informative and um, help you understand some of the resources that are available during this time. The next slide, please. Oh. We're gonna share a testimonial from UCO. Hi, this is Grace and Heather. We just wanted to say thank you to UCO Respite Services. They were here for us during the pandemic and allowed me to go to work, which is huge. I wouldn't have been able to without them. Thank you so much. And here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Barbara Flood from the ARC of Palm Beach County is unable to be here, so I'll go over her slides. The ARC is one of the agencies that has been providing respite services throughout the pandemic. Um, this is their eligibility criteria. Um, uh, the individual must be a client um, and have a developmental disability. 
They must live in the family home. And the individual with a disability must not require nursing care um, or be a danger to themselves or others due to extreme self-abuse or physical aggression, suicidal tendencies, or runaway behaviors. Next slide, please. Some of the provider responsibilities is the respite provider is to be a caregiver to the participant in their own home in the absence of family members. And the provider is expected to be actively engaged and involved with the client. I know that when we did the respite survey, that was something very important to parents is that it wasn't just someone that was caring for the individual, but it was actively engaging, maybe teaching some skills and so forth. Next slide. Some of the, I'm sure as a parent, some of the, um, what you've been curious about is the, the safety protocols that have been put in place and, and working with the agencies, I, uh, they've been very thoughtful through this process. So some of the protocols that the ARC of Palm Beach have put in place is that um, they have provider calls, they have the provider call the family before a scheduled home visit. And they're required to fill out two forms. One is completed by the provider and one is completed by the family and they obtain the parent signature. Next slide, please. This is just a copy of the forms that they have. And you can see um, both of them are asking similar information. And the priority here is to ensure that both the family, the individual um, requiring the respite, the family, and also um, that the provider, the respite care provider are all kept, kept safe. So they're asking those questions such as, um, have you or your family any of the, have any of the symptom, following symptoms, a fever, sore throat, shortness of breath, cough? Um, they're looking at traveling outside of the state or country for the last 14 days. And they're looking at um, um, exposure. And you can see the questions are similar. So it's, the, um, it's incumbent upon the agency and important for them to ensure that both the family members and the respite care provider are kept safe through this process. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the protocols that have been put in place for um, ensuring um, uh, safety again. All team members are provided um, gloves, a fresh pair for every visit, hand sanitizer, face masks, and face shields if desired. And then PPB, PPE is provided to the families who request it for their visit. Next slide, please. And here's Barbara's information. Um, Barbara um, works um, for the, the ARC of Palm Beach County. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to her. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here today. So the next presentation is uh, by United Community Options of Palm Beach and Broward County, uh, Carolina uh, Foksinski. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here with you all in honor of last month's National Family Caregivers Month. Um, my name is Carolina Fokshinsky. I am the respite coordinator for United Community Options of Palm Beach County. And if we could go to the next slide, please. So United Community Options is a nonprofit organization. Um, we serve over 1,600 individuals in over 60 locations throughout South Florida. Um, we serve children and adults with a wide range of special needs and abilities, including physical, intellectual, neurological, and more is listed on the bottom of this slide. And if we go to the next slide, please. So about our respite program. Um, it is a free of charge service that we provide to families. And in order to be eligible for our respite program, the child or youth must be between the ages of birth to 18. And the child must be diagnosed with a deve developmental disability or medical condition. Um, unfortunately, to qualify, the family cannot be receiving med waiver, nor can they be receiving respite from another respite program in Palm Beach County. And uh, lastly, to qualify, the child must reside in their home in Palm Beach County. Like, our, like I mentioned, um, our services are of no cost to you or your family. So if you are interested in our respite services, um, my contact information, as well as the program directors is listed below. And then if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, our direct support professionals have continued to provide respite, um, essentially essential workers. And so while we continue to provide respite services, um, we're ensuring that proper safety protocols are being followed. Um, so in addition to providing educational, health and nutritional services to our families throughout the pandemic, we also implemented a strict safety plan that follows CDC guidelines to minimize risk of transmission while we provide the services. So during 
um, respite, um, we require all of our staff to wear PPE. That includes masks, face shields, gloves, and masks if the children receiving the respite are capable in wearing them. Um, we also allocate time for sanitation of all materials used during the respite session. And there are strict protocols in place if staff or client exhibits any symptoms. Um, we do also provide a questionnaire beforehand to make sure, uh, similar to the ARC, um, just have you left the country? Um, have you been in contact with anyone who's tested positive? Things of that nature. Um, all of our direct support professional staff has had up-to-date COVID-19 trainings, and we also um, test our staff bi-weekly. Um, next slide, please. And then a big thank you to our sponsors and our UCO staff who have worked tirelessly to maintain the safety precautions, and they've continued providing our families with the help they need. Um, next up is going to be Miss Laura Shields with Grandma's Place to talk about their services. Hello, uh, my name is Laura Shields. I am the rest of care coordinator for Grandma's Place. I'm just going to go over a few of our requirements for our program. Um, we, for, for the requirements, you have to live in Palm Beach County. The family has to. The child has to be younger than 12 years old and it has to have a diagnosis. We also have an intake assessment that we do. And um, if you uh, have all your requirements, then we will uh, go towards the process of filling out all the paperwork and then um, you'll be able to use our program. We provide around 15 hours a month. Um, it's completely free. And um, we are in, in Royal Palm Beach. So we do provide our services in our facility. Um, we are open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So we do provide services at any time, even if it's an emergency, you can always call us um, in case uh, that, that you need the services right away. Uh, we also do in advance. So if you want to plan something or you have something going on that you would like to see if we have availability, you can always reach out. Uh, we provide parent training and parent mentoring. Uh, right now we're doing it online, but we, uh, we used to provide it um, in our facility, but right now we're doing it online. So if you want more, um, if more information about it, I can, you can always reach out to me as well. Um, we are taking some of the, the uh, procedures that we're doing for our, for COVID-19 are that we're taking children's temperatures. Um, we're also wearing masks. All the staff is wearing masks and sanitizing every time a child leaves or comes in. Um, we're also uh, picking up all of the children from the parking lot instead of everyone coming in our facility. So there's no contact within anyone. Uh, they just come in and then um, they are drop off. Um, we have the amount of children that we are providing services to, we also have minimized them uh, just to make sure that everyone can keep social distancing. Um, and that's basically our all our uh, programs and everything that we provide, uh, these programs are provided by Palm Beach County Youth Services and they are completely free. And that's my information. Uh, if you have any questions or would like more information or you want the package to fill out at home, you can always do that and then give me a call um, if you have any more questions. Thank you. The next person is Kevin Nick Allen from YMCA Boca Raton. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Kevinick Allen. I'm a youth program coordinator here at the Peter Blum Family YMCA in Palm Beach County. Um, so some of the services that we offer here for our Chase's Place, um, we do offer after school care program um, where they can come after school on um, the buses do drop them off here um, and then we're open until 6 p.m. Um, and we do have our fun days. So whenever school is out, um, according, we do follow the Palm Beach County school schedule. Um, we are open for care from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we're bringing back next, next month and starting January, we're starting back our parents' night out. 
Um, so basically, once a month, we'll be offering the services from 6 p.m. to 9.30 um, for parents who want to get out, um, have a date night. You could drop your child off there. Um, and then we also have our summer and holiday camps. We just had our Thanksgiving break camp. We have our winter break camp coming up, and then we'll have our spring break and summer break camp. Um, and so that is offered for a full day as well um, for our participants. Next slide, please. Um, so basically, in order to be a participant here, we do require an intake interview. Um, we offer services for children with disabilities from the ages of five years old to 22 years old. Um, so basically for the intake interview, they, the family um, and the child will have to come in um, and we, that gives the family a chance to see our facility, to see our staff um, and to meet with us and just talk about that to see if our um, program is a great fit for them. Um, and once if the family meets all the requirements and we, uh, everything goes well, then we go ahead and the participant can start as soon as possible. Um, next slide. Um, that's my contact information. Um, some of the, uh, uh, as well as the safety precautions that we take, all of our staff are required to wear masks. Um, we have multiple sanitizing stations throughout the facility. Uh, we do encourage our participants to wear masks when they're inside the building. Um, however, when they are outside, they don't have to. Uh, we have our staff, we put them in a baggie for them so it's not in contact with anything else. Um, and then we do try to limit uh, the amount of outsiders inside the facility. So once a participant becomes, starts attending our program, they will be, um, they will be escorted to and from their cars for drop off and pick up. Um, there's my information right there. Um, you can call me or email me and there's our address. Um, so thank you guys so much for having me. Um, next up, we're going to have, um, Connie from the American Association of Caregiving Youth. Hello, and um, thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Connie Siskowski, founder and president of the American Association of Caregiving Youth. So you may never have heard the term caregiving youth before. Um, and our focus is on children in middle and high school who provide care for family members who may be ill or injured or elderly or disabled. Um, we are a nonprofit, and uh, we also began the Caregiving Youth Institute in 2014. We'll be having a virtual conference in April and then an in-person conference in November. So our Caregiving Youth Project, uh, which provides direct services in Palm Beach County, began in 2006. Um, we work in partnership with the school district. And uh, right now we're in 32 middle and high schools uh, throughout the Palm Beach County area. We've served over 1800 caregiving youth and uh, their families during this time. Next slide. So, um, <clears throat> so this is the formal definition of a caregiving youth. And these children very much mirror uh, what an adult family caregiver does. So they may do anything from providing personal care to doing chores. Um, many give medications and help with other uh, medical treatments at home. And so it might be for a grandparent, it could be for a parent. Um, you can think about, you know, if you happen to be a single parent and you get sick and you only have one child, you know, what's the impact on that child? Or perhaps it's a grandparent raising grandchildren and then the grandparent gets sick. And those children have already been through one trauma, which is why uh, their grandparents are raising them. So um, I don't know about you. For me, I know that it's really hard to focus if I'm under stress and it's, it's really a challenge to learn. So um, next slide. The areas that we work on um, to provide services and again our services are at no cost um, in school we identify the kids beginning in sixth grade we have a formal curriculum with skills building that lasts from sixth grade through high school we do special workshops like we're getting ready to do 
um, a high school workshop for um, our, our high school seniors to help them with uh, college applications. Um, we do lunch and learn sessions, which are focused on a particular diagnosis each month. Uh, this, this year, we've done a pilot project between our social work interns and medical students from FAU uh, who are doing the lunch and learns virtually. And as are all of our other, most all of our other services are being provided virtually, at least those in school. Um, but one thing that's neat about doing virtual is that previously um, lunch and learn sessions have been focused on um, our kids who are caregivers. And by doing it virtually, it allows family members to also participate. So we know that by strengthening the family, we can help to reduce stress on the child. And this is what, um, this is what helps them learn. So um, sometimes it may be that a child has to get home from school because his mom, um, who um, they have a, a brother with special needs and they don't have a ramp. So he had to get home in order to lift uh, their, his brother into the house. Um, so we were able to um, have a ramp built. Um, and through our identification at home, we provide respite. And our respite is kind of unique. Um, it's called youth directed respite. And that means that sometimes it could be a home health aide who comes into the home to help with personal care or other things. But I don't know about you, some kids, um, and I, I guess I could put myself in that category, you know, cleaning is not my favorite thing. And so we just started a new program with uh, cleaning services in place of respite because, you know, in, in place of a home health aid, because, you know, some children don't mind giving medications, but they may not like cleaning. And we're also doing a program with um, home delivered meals because some kids like to cook and some don't. So this is about whatever gives the student a break from their caregiving responsibilities. And then we also do uh, out of school activities and overnight camp. Our holiday celebration this year is going to be at the Palm Beach Zoo. Um, it's always a big event for the kids and their families. And um, if we have the next slide, please, I'd like you to hear directly from one of our kids. Daniel Garcia, I'm a caregiver for my grandma who has several health issues. AACY is a place that has helped me deal with uh, a lot of emotions and I wouldn't be able to cope with all my duties, not only uh, in my household, but also academically participate in any sport. I wouldn't be able to be myself. That's a really important help for me as, as a human being. Before I had AACY, um, I couldn't even ask for permission to go out. But now with um, the respite system, at least I can um, ask my dad if during that time um, I'll be able to hang out. That at least gives me the opportunity to go outside and try to be myself. ACY means to me a safe place. Thanks, Susie. So this is um, my contact information. Um, my email is just connie at aacy.org. Again, uh, we are so appreciative of this opportunity to share a little bit of information with you. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more. And uh, we have many more videos on our website. Um, some deal with respite and some just uh, get to share the stories of the kids and what they do. And uh, really, as we uh, ended, National Family Caregivers Month last month, you know, children who are caregivers are often left out um, and there's yet no uh, legislative recognition for them. So that's one of the things that we're working on and looking forward to November 2021 when all our lives are a little bit more normal and um, kids can, who are caregivers can have respite to and be recognized. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce Linda Sachs from JACPO. Here we go. Hello, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity 
to present what JAFCO's respite services um, are all about and to be among such great colleagues. As I'm speaking, you're gonna see a little bit of a slideshow of what our JAFCO Children's Ability Center looks like. I guess I wanna start with just letting you know that JAFCO has been an agency in existence for over 28 years, starting with child abuse and more recently over the past six years, opening the doors to our JAFCO Children's Ability Center, both of which are located in Sunrise. And this facility is conveniently located off the Sawgrass Expressway. We serve the, the Tri-County area. So not only do we serve Palm Beach, but we also serve Broward County and Dade County. And we serve individuals from birth through age 22 with any kind of developmental disability. Our services are wide, but the flagship program is our respite program. And I will make mention of our other programs that, uh, that, that, that support the entire family. And when we opened our ability center, that's really what we were trying to do. We really listened to parents and we really understood that what affects one member of the family, the child affects the entire family. And so our continuum of services do, do range from case management, and um, uh, many, many programs. We actually are open 365 days a year, 24-7. Um, We're a very large facility that's fully gated and very safe. And we have probably five acres with a two-story resource center and a guest house that's 5,000 square feet for overnight respite. But let me, let me just focus initially on our respite program. First of all, we all know from all the things we've said that it's for the benefit of the entire family that respite services exist, that not only does it give a, a break, an opportunity for parents to relax and refresh and do things for themselves and do things with other family members, but also is importantly, it provides our children with an opportunity to make friends to learn social skills and to learn life skills. So when children are with us, that is our mission. We are trying to make sure that children who don't have all these opportunities are not left behind. During a day of respite, children are given the opportunity to move with small groups. We, we, we do have an intake procedure, you know, that starts with a virtual tour at this time. Then we, we have a, a, an intake and um, we then assess what is the, um, the, the ratio, the child to staff ratio. We are able to serve one-on-one, -on -one, uh, two to one and three to one staff to child ratio. And we are there to really make sure that children are gonna be successful. So when they come to us for programming, whether it be respite or a music club or a life skill club or a catering club, they're going to be in a small group of no larger than eight to 10 children. And they're gonna be with children who are on the same developmental or cognitive level of ability. So they're gonna be in small groups and um, they're gonna be rotating or a typical day of rest, but every 35 minutes, they're going to be engaged in a different activity. So it could be music, and then they're moving to outside play because we have a very large outside play area. And then they could be moving on to literacy program. So it's a very rich day. And I think the point I wanna make, and I, I know I have very limited time, is that in order for parents to feel comfortable leaving their children with any of us, they need to see us in action. So there are many opportunities for parents to observe us with, uh, uh, when it's not COVID, typically they'll come for parent education and leave their children for childcare and get comfortable and, and we earn their trust. But parents just need to know when their children are with us that not only are they safe, and we are a child abuse agency, so safety is our number one consideration. And we do have a nurse full time on staff when your children are there. But we also, we, we comfort parents by letting them know that your children are going to be engaged and they're going to be learning. So they're going to be with experienced, vetted staff that have been thoroughly background screened. They are professionals. They are, the, they are those aides and teachers and professionals working with your children, um, you know, in their typical days. And your children are going to be learning things. So most parents 
once they realize that this is a real nurturing and therapeutic opportunity for children to feel more comfortable saying, okay, I'm gonna take this time for myself. Um, as everybody else has mentioned, we do all the same safety guidelines as everyone else. Parents at this point in time are not coming into the building. We are going outside to pick up the children and bring them inside. There's all kinds of PPEs and hand washing. And we are very proud to say that since March, we have been opened. We have been providing face-to-face -face services and we have had no COVID at our facilities. Um, let's see, in terms of funding, um, we do have a very large state allocation, which allows for our families living in Palm Beach County to take advantage and, and receive respite. Again, respite can be, uh, can be utilized for a few hours, a whole day, an overnight or actually a couple of weeks at a time. We have a respite home on our facility and we can do overnight respite. So once again, um, if you'd like to learn more about respite, please feel free to contact me. You see my contact information on the screen. We have a virtual tour and uh, question and answers and a screening procedure and then a, a virtual uh, intake uh, will follow. So I look forward to hearing from the parents that are in this group, if there's anything I can help you with. Uh, and one more thing I just want to mention, um, in addition to all of the services I've talked about, there's also many really powerful support groups. And this is a perfect segue because I'm going to be introducing right now Zippy Rosen of the Ruth and Norman Rails Jewish uh, Family Services. And Zippy and I co-facilitate groups every week for parents and for grandparents. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, so I don't, I just want to say it's really such an amazing thing for me to be a part of working with all of you wonderful um, individuals and agencies and everything that you offer the kids. Um, so I am the special needs um, community liaison and outreach worker for Ruth and Norman Rails Jewish Family Services. I don't offer, we don't offer respite services per se, but what we do offer for those that are living in Boca, Delray, Highland Beach, um, we offer um, financial assistance to those that qualify for respite services um, that we can help them to kind of get it started, um, get over the hump of, you know, the families that need it um, and that financial piece of it. Um, and so that's a, a, a one thing I do in addition with Linda said, we do the support groups weekly. They're now running virtual. Um, so really anyone can join from anywhere. Um, I'm just, I'm a resource for families that need anything. You know, I get calls a lot for respite care. And then I tell them about all the, you, your wonderful agencies out there. Um, <clears throat> again, just information and referral. Um, I get a lot of calls. Um, I run case management for adults with special needs, um, which is another piece of the puzzle for, um, you know, as people are living longer, um, parents are, you know, want that extra hand. Um, and this could be a really good fit. Um, so again, if anyone needs anything, reach out, just information about respite care any financial assistance that they'd like to apply for. If you live in the Boca Del Rey area, please feel free to reach out. My contact information is there. And thank you for letting me be a part of all this. I now want to introduce uh, Randy Gabriel from 211. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. I'm from 211. It's a crisis hotline, a community helpline. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our services and how we can assist families that need respite and with their um, with finding respite and all of their other needs. Uh, we, um, we provide suicide prevention and crisis intervention, information and referral, emergency counseling, advocacy programs. We have a community resource database that you can access online. Um, you can reach us by calling us to styling 211. You can text 898-211, or you can chat online and or email us at help at 211pbtc.org. 
We have trained staff available to speak with um, callers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We never close. We have over 1,600 agencies in our program, um, program system. We represent thousands and thousands of services, and they are outdated on a continual basis, which is really so important because um, here today, gone tomorrow is, 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 a, is our reality. So we make sure that everything that we give families and callers, the information is updated and current. So I want to talk about a little bit about our newest program, which is our 211 caregiving program, which we provide support and navigation to caregiver to caregivers 18 years and older, caring for a person 18 years and older. So we provide support, information and resources, encouragement, and sometimes just a friendly voice to listen. Um, you know, we get we we have done our soft launch last week and we're continuing this week so this is our brand new program hot out the press that you're getting information on and we've already gotten calls and what we have found is more than anything the caregivers are looking for support and someone to listen to them um, sometimes they're alone in a home giving um, providing the caregiving and they have no outlet so just having someone to talk to sometimes and give them encouragement is is there is what they need. So in a, in <clears throat> I want to give you a little bit of information from AARP, which is one of the funders of the, our caregiver program. Um, in 2020, 53 million people were providing caregiving. 89% of those were relatives. And 45% of those said they had at least one financial impact due to the caregiving. 61% of those giving caregiving were still working. And 23% of Americans say that caregiving has made their health worse. So, you know, when we think about that, those are really big numbers. And not only is it respite, but also support that these families need. 20% of family caregivers have never received any help or information. That's 20% of 53 million. Um, that's huge. Um, so we, we encourage you to refer to our caregiving program. If you are working with families, I have a, um, a social worker in the program working. She is only working part time right now because the program is just now getting up and running and it only calls for a part time staff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of our other programs very quickly, because as you give respite to families um, and you get families calling you for services, um, we also supply the information and resources for those families. Um, in addition to our caregiving program, we have a Help Me Grow, which is an information referral and screening program. We provide a Sunshine Daily Reassurance program, uh, which calls over 600 uh, individuals in our five county service area on a daily basis for a well being check. And yes, some of those people that we call are caregivers because if they're caring for someone who is non ambulatory and not able to function independently and something happens to them, um, that it, it impacts the person they're caring for. So we call caregivers also. We have a vet program that provides information, resources, and referrals and peer support for veterans. We have an elder crisis outreach that helps elders in our, in our Palm Beach County area that are in crisis. Our special needs helpline, uh, which provides information and referrals to families that have children zero to 22 that have a disability. We have seasonal programs, which are on the on next slide, which are on, on the slide. I won't go through all of them but they're there for your information. And just remember, I want everyone to remember that um, we are free, we are confidential, we're 24 seven. Um, we have information and access to community resources. And we, we are what we like to refer to as a judge free zone. Um, I have, next slide is my contact information. And, um, and, and um, 
in to acknowledge the National Caregiver Month, I just want to say that when there is someone in the house, help that needs caregiving, whether it be someone's mother, someone's father, someone's grandparent, all of the family members become caregivers, and um, it it becomes it becomes a chore for everyone, and everyone helps. So it may not just remember it's not just that one person that providing the caregiver, it's all the family members. Thank you so much for having me today. If you have any questions, there's my contact information. And please know we're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week to assist. Thank you. Okay. So oh, I'm it, sorry. I'm supposed to okay. be the next person, aren't I? <laughs> Darn, I thought I was done. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce Shane. Weatherspoon from United Way. She will be speaking for Bernadette Macy from Catholic Charities. That was awesome. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> um, so Bernadette from Catholic Charities was not able to be here with us today. So I will just um, review her slides with everyone. Next slide, please. So Catholic Charities offers positive tools for caregivers, um, positive ways for self-care, progressive muscle relaxation, stress reduction, improved decision-making, lots of different things that um, they do during our workshops for caregivers. So this is evidence-based for family caregivers. It's about two and a half hours a week for six weeks and it's being offered online. So again, this is a workshop that any family caregiver can take advantage of and it is being offered virtually to really help um, self-care for caregivers because as we talked about before if we're not taking care of ourselves it makes it really difficult to take care of others uh, so if you have questions or about that how to get involved more information about it Bernadette's information is here the phone number and the uh, email address and also you can register through the area agency on aging and that telephone number is listed on the slide as well oh, next slide please there's Bernadette's information again. And next slide, please. So this is an important question that Bernadette's given us some information about. So how can we pay for respite services? A lot of the providers that have already spoken said that their services are, are free, which is amazing, but there are some that are not. So with those, um, some agencies do require you to pay out of pocket and those can cost here $20 or more an hour and then they have a minimum number of hours that you would be able to access respite services. There's also long-term care insurance policies, but again, these vary just depending on the policy and the coverage you have. So it may take really doing some deep diving and researching and, and comparing plans. Respite though is one of the supports that's offered through the state of Florida's Family Caregiver Support Program. So there's more information about that if you call the Aging and Disability Resource Center and that information is listed here on the slide. And this helps you to find a family caregiver support program that is closest to you. Next slide, please. Uh, Medicaid waivers, we're gonna hear more about that with our, our next presentation. Um, but here Bernadette just lets us know that this is the largest federal source of funding available uh, for respite for low income households. Each state has their own eligibility criteria and conditions for specific populations. And there's more information if you contact um, the Area Agency and Aging Helpline number, or if the person that you're caring for happens to be a veteran, there is a VA caregiver support line listed here as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I will now introduce uh, our friends from the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. I think it's Mallory and Mary. Hi, this is Mary Edwards from the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Um, the um, presentation before regarding respite, um, you know, have been wonderful. Uh, the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, we do not provide respite, however, in order to uh, receive respite through our program, you first must be eligible under the one of the categories for um, a person that with developmental disabilities. Um, 
so it will start with a referral and an application process. Uh, we can take a referral directly from someone re uh, seeking services, a legal representative, other sources, family, friends, agencies, other professionals. Um, acceptance subject to applicant's consent or their legal representative. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, what happens is once we get a referral, we'll send out an application packet. Once we receive the application packet, we review for the eligibility determination um, to make sure that a person is eligible for these services uh, and or the ad budget waiver services. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, referrals may be uh, taken in person, in writing, by phone, by fax, by the website, by court order. Uh, APD staff will follow up and confirm interest. Uh, if it, the person is over 18 years of, of age, we must have uh, their signature on the application or they must have a legal representative. Next slide. Uh, things that we will send out in the referral packet is the application for service, the bill of rights, information regarding the family care council, uh, information about serving Florida, uh, Floridians with uh, developmental disabilities, a guide to administrative hearing, your HIPAA rights, and we will also ask you to sign a consent to release, and, um, release confidential information. Next slide. Um, the Application for services is available online at apdcares.org forward slash customers forward slash application. It's available in English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. Uh, it's divided into sections, um, the applicant, the legal representative, and for the re regional staff. Uh, the initial contact letter requires that you return the application within 60 days. If we do not receive your application back, we will close the referral. Next slide. Um, the disabilities that we, um, that we are responsible for, intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy, autism, prey to Willie, Down syndrome, Fela McDermott, and children between three and five are put in a category called high risk in which uh, at the age of five, we retest to make sure that they in fact meet the criteria for uh, enrollment onto the wait list and eventually onto the iBudget waiver. Next slide, please. Um, and that's a reiteration of what we've already said. So you can move to the next slide. Uh, in order to be eligible, uh, the condition must manifest prior to the age of 18. Uh, it constitutes a substantial handicap that may that can be reasonably expected to continue indefinite. You must be at least three years of age and a resident and domiciled in the state of Florida. Next slide. Uh, not all APD eligible clients meet the level of care uh, criteria for ICF or IDD uh, and placement onto the waiver. Requirements for the waiver eligible worksheet are as follows. Next slide. Um, we will make a determination within uh, 45 days for children who are six years of age or under uh, 60 days of a signed application turned in six years age or over and 90 days when additional information is needed. Um, next slide. Um, next slide. So basically in a nutshell, what I would like to reiterate is that uh, the only way for the agency um, to uh, pay for respite is that a person must be first eligible for the wait list. The, uh, and in order to uh, be eligible for the wait list, you must go through the application process and you also um, must be eligible, meet the level of care for uh, the Medicaid I budget waiver program. Uh, you cannot receive respite service unless you are on the waiver program. Uh, we do not have uh, other funding sources to pay for respite other than through the, med the I budget Medicaid waiver program. 
Uh, if you need additional information regarding how to get an application, what uh, is needed to support your, um, your eligibility determination, you can certainly call us at 561-837-5564, uh, or you can email uh, either one of us uh, to see if in fact that you, uh, you or your child meets the eligibility criteria. And um, just to, um, to let you all know, everybody that's diagnosed with a developmental disability will not necessarily meet the eligibility criteria. Our staff, once you provide us with all of the documentation that is provided, then we will make a determination of whether the um, whether an individual or applicant meets the eligibility criteria. So uh, I just uh, you know want to make sure that everyone understands. Yes, you have to have a diagnosis, but every diagnosis does not equal eligibility for the Medicaid waiver waitlist or Medi or the Medicaid waiver program, or eventually enrolled onto the Medicaid waiver uh, program. Um, if you have any questions, you can certainly uh, put it in the chat box and um, I will try to answer any questions that you might have. I'm over my time. Uh, the next person would be uh, training for respite care workers. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Susanna Launder, and I'm going to just be talking about the REST uh, companion training that we have here in Palm Beach County. Um, so Sharon talked about it a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, REST stands for Respite Education Support and Tools. And um, myself and Zippy provide the respite training um, through our agencies. And the training is a full day. It's a day long training for individuals that are interested in becoming a respite companion. And through this training, um, we talk about a variety of different things. We talk about the importance of building rapport and the importance of respecting the caregivers and respecting the care receiver. Um, we also talk about the importance of maintaining safety and following health guidelines and just really anything that you may need to, to think about if you are considering becoming a respite companion. Um, as you can see from this flyer, we actually have a training that is scheduled um, for this week in two days on Thursday, in fact. Um, if anybody is interested in registering for that, we can most certainly get the, the link to you. Um, the trainings are taking place completely online through Zoom um, in a very similar format to what we've seen here today. And um, at the end of the training, participants do get a certificate of completion that is just available to let caregivers and other folks know that you've received this training specific to providing um, respite care. And then on this slide, you can see my contact information as well as Zippy's. You can contact either of us directly by email or by phone if you have further questions about the REST training. Um, we are both very flexible ladies and we are more than happy to look at um, providing this training really for anybody that's interested if the date that we have um, identified in December at least doesn't work. Um, we have another one that is going to be held in February as well. So that, that information is going to be forthcoming. So now what we're going to do is I'm actually going to come out of the slideshow for a moment so that we can go ahead and take a look just real quickly at the chat and see if there are any questions that might need to be answered. So the chat has been very, very active. Um, let's see what we've got. So we have one question from a parent that wanted to know if during respite, are we expecting for the disabled individual to wear a mask at all times? Um, so I'm not going to speak directly to any specific agency, but um, it did sound like if the individual at some agencies is able to wear the mask, that is the expectation. Um, if any of the agencies that are providing direct respite would like to address that, that would be very helpful. 
All right, and then we have some conversation about that. So we have some families that are looking for respite specifically, and um, it seems that folks have been providing their contact information. And then also there is going to be a detailed APD presentation. Um, Mary Edwards will be presenting at JAFCO on, or for JAFCO through Zoom on Monday, December 7th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, I, I would encourage folks if you're at all interested or you have questions to go ahead and, and take that opportunity because it can be a complex process. If I could say something, Susanna, in regards to that, we know how complex it is and therefore we have three presentations on three consecutive Mondays. So if anybody's interested, we've broken it out for people at different levels because not everybody needs to start at the beginning. Some people are already on med waiver and they wanna learn more about CDC plus or the crisis waiver or something else. So contact me and I will explain to you, um, you know, all the different presentations that APD is gonna be doing in December. Fantastic, thank you. And then we also do have, I believe that Yanira would like for, I believe Linda maybe to contact her specifically about respite for her son. Um, are there any other questions? Are all respite homebound or can we go out and stay um, outside of the agency? So that's a really good question. So I think the, the next question is, are all of the respite services homebound? Um, I believe that some of them are and some of them are not. Some of them are, are center-based. I, I know that when the, the Kevin Eek spoke from the Y, their respite and their support services are at their center, along with um, grandma's place is at their center also. I believe UCO is center-based as well. Um, also, if someone is receiving respite, can they pause it for a while, like ABA therapy, for example, pause for a month so time isn't running close to the end of the service? That's a really good question. So I think the question is, if you're receiving respite, can you take a break from it and then um, come back to it? Um, would anybody, any of the panelists, like to answer that one? Because I'm honestly... Not sure. Okay, wait, if the respite caregiver can go out with the family when they are on a store. Okay, so that's a good question. So um, the question is that if you are doing in-home respite care and you have a respite provider, are they able to leave the home and like go on an errand for you? Um, would one of the agencies that provides in-home care like to answer that? Maybe Carolina from UCO. Hi, sorry, I was having trouble oh, unmuting okay. there. <laughs> so for our respite program, it is only in-home respite. Um, the caregivers are not allowed to go outside with the clients whatsoever. Are it's only within the client's home. Are the parents allowed to leave the home with? Yes, yes, okay. they are. Um, so if the for parent needs to go run an errand, they could. Yes, absolutely. And we also do um, any time really into even the nighttime um, if the parent requests it early in advance and we're able to find a sitter available for those night hours. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, were there any other questions? Okay, well, I think then, um, we are coming close to the end of our time together. So I'm gonna go back to our slideshow. Susie, you may wanna mention that um, this is recorded yes. and um, um, all of the agencies here will be posting this on, um, on their website. Um, so uh, if you'd like to have a copy or review the recording, you're more than welcome to do so. Yes, thank you, Mary Ellen. That's actually one of the questions was if they will receive a copy of this presentation. So this 
Like Mary Ellen said, this presentation has been recorded and will be made avail available on each of the different agencies' websites. So you'll be able to view that recording through that avenue. All right. And then- I don't think the pause answer was answered. They were asking again, Carolina, can they pause respite for a while if they want to? I do you mean in the sense of like they get it for a couple of months and then they want to go on vacation with the child? Um, they can take a month off. Yes, of course. Um, we are on an as need basis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we are gonna go back and we are gonna go into our closing remarks. Oh wait, I can't see that. Hey, that's me again. So we would just first like to say a big thank you to all of our panelists for this amazing information. And thank you to the Palm Beach County Respite Committee for all of the hard work that went into putting this webinar together. Um, all right, we would also like to thank our funders, Children's Services Council, Unicorn Children's Foundation, and United Way of Palm Beach County for supporting this important work. And most importantly, we just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us today. We hope that this webinar helped you learn about some of the resources that are available to you in Palm Beach County. And we hope it serves as a reminder that your hard work and dedication to caring for your loved ones is supported and really appreciated. So thank you all. Yes, thank you. And I am gonna check one more time because I think that there's another question that's popped up. Now, Zippy has shared um, the website for Ruth Rails and our REST training that's coming up this week. So please, if anybody is interested, if you have a um, loved one or if you have someone that you think would be really, really helpful, a friend that could benefit from being a, a respite provider, please share the information for our training. And so the question has come up of how you can get a copy of this recording. So the recording will be made available on each of the agency's websites. So you can go to autism.fau.edu, which is the FAU <laughs> and the recording will be available there as well as all of the other websites of the agencies that were here today that I can't list off the top of my head, unfortunately. Okay. All right, well, if there are, let me look in the question. Is MedWaver considered when an application is made directly through um, SSA or only through APD? Only through APD. Oh, only through APD. So they are not connected, correct? They are not connected. Thank you. Is there a fee for the respite training? No, the respite training is completely free. Thank you for asking. Yes, thank you everyone for being here. So I am gonna go ahead and, and say that this was a very successful webinar and we appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much.